Thanks for coming. I'm Rachel O'Mara, and I'm really excited today to host Arjuna, Ar Arda. He's here to tell us many things, to tell us a lot about the technology and our, and our inner wisdom and how to really tap into that. So you're here today to listen to him talk about what it means to be in the flow and how do we get there. What does it mean when you're at work here at Google? What does it mean in your life? What does it mean with your relationships? What does it mean for, for any real reason to, to live a little more meaningfully? How many people here feel like they're in the flow right now? Show of hands, don't be shy. How many people are like, what am I doing here? I just saw this poster and I showed up. Okay, well guess what? We're all in the flow. We're all here today. Congratulations. So I know Arjuna through a mutual friend and I actually talked to him a couple years ago and we decided to bring him in a couple months ago and I'm really excited because I think he has a lot of really great things to share with us. His latest book, he's actually written eight books. It's quite an accomplishment. His, li his latest book is called Better Than Sex. It is actually not about what you think it's about. It's about awakening coaching. And what does that mean? And it, and it actually ties in very well with the flow in terms of how do, we, how do we live more awake? How do we feel more alive? Because we all want more of that, I'm pretty sure. So I'm very really excited to to introduce Arjuna, and he's gonna tell us a lot about it. So thank you for coming, thank you for tuning in, and I will hand it over. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll also have some question time at the end as well. Good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good middle of the day. I, was, uh, I already have been a fan of Google for a long time in terms of search engine. Uh, being able to find things on the web, but really, actually, Google's uh, achievements in, as a search engine are nothing compared to its achievements as a host, because uh, the, the, this is a wonderful environment and a, a, a very uh, welcoming place. So we're going to talk today about genius, I believe. I think, the, the t is that correct? The title of the talk was The Technology of Genius. Is that what, how, it was, uh, how it was labeled? So we're going to talk about genius. I, actually, I, I feel like genius is... Uh, is a topic we don't want to get too defined about, too, um, too comfortable about. It's, a, it's an ongoing investigation. So actually, in the drive down in the car, while my friend Jonathan was behind the wheel, I was, I was uh, coming up with my latest version of my understanding of genius. So I think of genius as the capacity to express things that are new, the capacity to bring forth ideas an embodiment of those ideas in a way that's not been done before, but in a way that is aligned with the collective evolution of humanity. See the point? Because you can come up with new ideas and new thoughts, but if it's completely skew to where the rest of humanity is going, no one's going to take any notice. So an example, one of the most obvious examples to me of genius is Niklaus Copernicus who founded Dell Computer, I think, was it? I... <laughs> Nicholas Copernicus, back in the 16th century, he had the, just the idea. It began just with an inkling that perhaps there was a way to explain the erratic behavior of the planets. It appeared at that time that the planets were like billiard balls just going in bizarre directions at the whim of some kind of creator with ADD. And it was Nicolaus Copernicus who thought that maybe it could be the other way around. Maybe, in fact, instead of everything going around the Earth in a completely unintelligible way, maybe, in fact, we, like the other planets, are going around the sun, which suddenly everything made sense. Copernicus's discovery was not only about astronomy. It was about things making sense. It was about a universe that actually was intelligible. And this gave rise to shifts in, humanita in hum humanitarianism, in art, in architecture, in all kinds of fields were transformed through this shift in understanding. So that's an example of genius, somebody who had the right idea at the right time, but it was aligned with the next shift for humanity anyway. So in a way, the same thing is true of where we are sitting today. 
where I'm standing today and you're sitting today. Uh, years ago, Larry and Sergey had an idea originally, an idea of how we could find information in the emerging web more efficiently, more easily, and it's turned into probably the most successful technology company in the world. So what is genius? What is it that allows some people to have the right idea at the right time that just takes off and is picked up by everybody? And what is it that causes other people to be in a different disposition, one more of cooperation with those ideas or following ideas? Or, uh, and sometimes which can lead to a feeling of frustration or that there's, there's more to my life than I'm living. So what is the, the, me the mechanism of genius? What is it that allows this mysterious click to happen when you're tapped into something way bigger than the conditioning of your own mind? That's really been the question that has governed my entire adult life. I've, from being a student at Cambridge University, that was really what fascinated me more than anything else. What is it that allows us, well, first of all, what is it that allows us to live incredibly fulfilled lives? What is the key that allows some people under almost any circumstance to be living a life of no regret, to be living a life where you're impassioned, where you're on fire, where you feel grateful easily? And what is it that allows many other people to be suffering, not always for physical reasons, but especially in our culture, people suffer more for psychological reasons, for attitudinal reasons, more than because they don't have enough food or water or, or um, physical things. Initially, in this investigation, I thought that ultimate fulfillment was to do with spirituality because the, a lot of the most fulfilled people in our culture have been mystics, have been people who have created spiritual traditions or religions. But actually, when we investigate it in an objective way, it's not always true. You can make your life about spirituality. You can make your life about meditation. It doesn't necessarily, in a reliable way, lead to fulfillment. So what else could it be? Then I considered maybe it's love. Maybe it's having perfect relationships, having the right spouse and the right 2.35 children in the right suburb of the right city. Maybe that's the key to fulfillment. We don't have so long to go into all the possibilities, and there are many possible answers. But what seems to hit the nail every time is to drop into the frequency of genius. When we fall into, as Rachel was speaking, when we fall into a flow, where you know you're doing the right thing. You know you're creating the right thing. You know that you're contributing exactly what you were born to contribute, to contribute to all of us moving forwards. That, I would say, whenever someone falls into that frequency, it's a reliable key to a life of no regret, to a life of complete fulfillment. So I want to talk to you here about some essential keys that I've discovered in investigating this my whole life. Essential keys which each one on their own may not be the reliable key to genius, but when we bring these keys together, I would say they provide the most reliable, the most predictable soil to bring forth genius. And before we go into the, the keys, I want to make an important distinction for all of us between meme and method. We're familiar with the word meme. Does it <laughs> jive for you? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Big time. Okay. So what I mean, what I understand by a meme is a commonly shared understanding about things which doesn't particularly belong to anybody. So a great example would be electricity, where electricity is a principle. Once we understand that if you've got cables and if you've got metal and you can uh, vibrate. My physics is probably a little shaky to really explain this properly. When you can vibrate atoms at a certain frequency, it will be carried along a piece of metal and create energy that can be moved from one place to another. Is that, did I do a hash job of that or is it in, in the right ballpark? Right. So electricity would be a meme, right? It doesn't belong to anybody once we understand it, it's universal. 
the light bulb invented by Thomas Edison would be a method. It's a method to, uh, to be able to use a mean, right? If we get too caught up in methods, we become essentially consumers. If you get too caught up in loyalty to methods, then you become a consumer of General Electric, the company founded by Thomas Edison, uh, and you forget the meme. The meme, when you have an understanding of meme, it opens up possibilities. When a meme becomes yours, you become the creator of methods instead of the follower of methods. So I want to introduce you to today seven important memes that I would say if you can find a way in your own way to embody these, to play with them, to experiment with them, it's going to radically increase your genius quota in your life starting today. Does that sound like a plan? Three people is good for me. OK. So the first principle, reliable principle, which brings forth genius, I would call inspired certainty. And I don't mean that you necessarily initially are certain with, inspired with certainty about your own ideas. Inspired certainty refers to the influence that someone else can have on you to be able to see through your conditioned thoughts, through your reactive feelings, which very often dominate our behavior, to see into the essence of you and to say, I see you in there. Beyond the habits you've learned, I see who you really are. I see the gift that is waiting to be born. When I was 14 years old, I went to a boarding school in England. The closest thing you have to that in America is a penitentiary. <laughs> so I went to an English boarding school where I had a, an English teacher whose name was Mr. Coleman. And he, he, was, uh, he was like Santa Claus, but with a, actually a dark beard instead of white. But he had a big, woofly beard. He was a big man. And he loved uh, great literature. So he would give us every week, he would say, just write from, write from your experience, write from what excites you, write from what you're passionate about. So I would go and do that. And I would take him back my essay, written, of course, in, in uh, squiggly fountain pen because we didn't have computers then. Also didn't have cars or uh... <laughs> my, my son's sitting here in the audience and he, uh, he sometimes asked me, Dad, when he was young, you said, Dad, did they have cars when you were growing up? <laughs> so no computers. So I was writing my essay by, uh, with, a, with a pen. And I can remember each week, Mr. Coleman would give me back my scrawly essay with wonderful, I always look forward to reading your, your writing. And then his illegible signature in red ink. If Mr. Coleman had not written those comments on my essay when I was 14, I don't think I would have had the energy to write eight books. That's what I would call inspired certainty. It can happen to you with a grandparent, with a parent. It can happen to you with a school teacher. It can happen to you today in your life with a mentor, with a coach. Someone who is willing to see beyond the conditioned reflexes that you have to life, many of which, for most of us, are limiting. Many of the conditioned reflexes are messages telling us, I can't do it. Who's going to listen? It's not possible. Who am I to do it anyway? Do you, you know what I mean? Obviously, that's a rare thing at Google. But anyway, it's uh, the rest of the humanity. <laughs> Many people suffer from those, those repeating thoughts which keep genius at bay. Inspired certainty is the first component, which is why the advent of coaching beyond sports in the last 20 years. If you go back 20 years, sport, coaching only existed in the, in the relationship we understand coaching to be in a sports context. The bursting out of coaching beyond the context of sports into the rest of life has allowed a huge acceleration in people being able to bring forth their genius. Because somebody else being able to look right into you and to see what is possible is a huge accelerator to the gifts that you were born 
to give in your lifetime actually being made manifest. The second key, which I'm actually not going to spend much time on today because it has more to do with coaching than really what we're speaking about here, has to do with presence. Learning, at least in moments, how to show up where you already are is a huge key to the unfolding of your gifts. We put an incredible emphasis, all of us, on the things that we say, the things that we do, the accomplishments we can check on or off on a to-do list. But actually, what I've noticed from studying highly, highly creative, successful, genius people, and from coaching people, the way that you show up, the presence with which you arrive into each situation in your life is more of a factor in genius than simply the things you accomplish. I'm going to skate over that one. If you want to know more about any of these, there are all seven of these principles are very thoroughly mapped out in the book that's at the back of the room. But the third principle of cultivating genius, in my opinion, is the most important. It's the component which, if you can tap into it, make it actual for yourself, it's the closest thing I know to a genius guarantee. What was it now? The most important key to bringing forth genius that I'm aware of, which is why I emphasize it so much in the coaching method that we teach, is the possibility to effectively tap into the dimension of yourself which is beyond conditioned thought and reactive feeling. We could call that awakening, a a, a nice little catch-all word for that, what I'm describing is awakening. Awakening means that the attention shifts deeper than where thoughts play, deeper than where reactive emotions happen, deeper than identification with the body into a recognition of who or what is actually experiencing this moment. Traditionally, that has been thought of as the domain of mystics. It's thought of as mysticism. That's what the word mysticism means, is shifting consciousness to discover the place where you no longer exist as a separate, localized point. But you still exist as consciousness without limits. I'm curious to know, before we go more deeply into this, how many people feel you recognize what I'm talking about from your own experience? You've had a taste, at least, of that. Great. It's a sign of the times. I've been teaching in this way for 25 years on this subject. 25 years ago, even if I went to a group of people who were predictably going to say yes, spiritually oriented people, very few hands would go up saying, yes, I know what you mean from direct experience. People would say, I've read about it. I've sat with a teacher who could emanate it. But very few people 25 years ago would say, I know what you mean from direct experience. Today, it's becoming almost commonplace, which is actually even bigger news for the future of humanity than breakthroughs in medicine or technology. The fact that we're having these shifts in consciousness, the likes of which we have no evidence of in our history, is extraordinarily hopeful good news, extraordinarily optimistic news. So let's experiment a little bit here right now together. What we mean by awakening, To the degree that the word means anything, it always points to this very moment now. Awakening in the way that I want to reference it here is never about anything in the future. 
never about anything that someone else has that you could get. It's always simply a returning the attention to what was already here underneath the thoughts and feelings, but was easily overlooked. So you don't need to meditate right now. You don't need to close your eyes or sit cross-legged or anything. We can just stay relaxed and as we are. But let's just take a moment together to recognize that in this moment, you are hearing the sound of this voice, right? Definitely true for everybody. You're hearing the sound of this English accent. And you might be able to say the words, I hear the voice, right? People say sentences like that, I hear the guy's voice. Who could say that? I hear the voice. You could say that's true right now, yeah? Equally, you can see the movement of this body standing here. You can see the movement of the hand. How many people could say that's true? I see the hand, right? So already in our experience, without any consciousness technology being employed, already in our experience, it's perfectly true that the sounds are being heard already. The movement of the of form is being seen already. And in the same way, sensations in the body are being felt already perfectly in this moment. There's no need to achieve any higher state. It's already completely here. Seeing, feeling, hearing. Already completely here. So we know what is the sound. It's this English voice, right? We know what is the hearing. It's the movement of the sound waves vibrating on the eardrum, activating the little nerve in there. As you can see, I know as much about uh, neurology as I do about uh, physics. But anyway, it, it does stuff in the brain. But still, none of that explains what we mean when we say I. I hear the sound. Now, when you say I hear the sound, most people, honestly, they're not really subjectively referring to the brain. Because you could actually equally say, my brain. You could say, I went to have a CAT scan. I saw a picture of my brain. So when we refer to ourselves as I, or we say me or my, it's actually, if you're just innocent about it, it's not really referring to any part of the body, including the brain or the nervous system. It's referring to something which, for most people, is inadequately explored. Would you agree? It's been given less attention than it could be given, which is strange since we use the word I or me or mine more than any other word in the day. It's strange that it gets so little attention. But here it is. In this moment, here in this room, you could say, I hear the sound. I see the movement. I feel the sensations in the body. So let's experiment. Let's just shift the attention in a very innocent way. Let's just shift the attention towards that. It's non-localized, so it's going to be a little bit of a, an experiment to shift the attention towards that which is hearing and seeing and feeling. It's already here. It's already completely here. It's what you call me. Only, usually, the attention is velcroing onto the movement of thought and feeling. So what happens? When the attention just begins to turn itself towards this which we call I or me, what happens? It may just be a tiniest perfume at the beginning, but what begins to reveal itself? Tell me. When you ask this question, who is hearing in this moment? Who is seeing? Who is feeling? What do you discover? Let's just, if you wouldn't mind, just call out a few tentative answers so we can. No idea. Great. Brilliant. Well, that's actually, let's start here. That's actually incredibly honest and scientific. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. It's great. It's fantastic. 
And it's a great revelation to see that all our lives we've been saying I and me, but when the attention turns back to that which is our true nature, it's never been touched yet by thought. It's beyond the realm of everything that's been thought about. It's fresh. It's an undiscovered territory. It's a brilliantly innocent and wise statement. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I found out about all this other stuff. I didn't actually check out who I am yet. You said? Present. Present. OK, so when we tune into this which is aware, it's a dimension of ourselves which is naturally present. Thought is not so naturally present. It's running in all directions. Reactive feeling is not naturally present. But when you return the attention to your own true nature, it's naturally present. Presence without having to try and to be present. Anybody else like to contribute? Yeah. Nothing. No thing. Not a thing. Yeah. It's not a thing. That's also a brilliant, amazing revelation to see. I've often referred to myself as though I am a thing, as though I have a number, and as though I'm separate. But when I actually check into that which is hearing and seeing and feeling, it's not a thing. Now imagine just for a moment if the story of your life began to play out more in alignment with the recognition that you're not a thing. There is a thing, a body with a name, but imagine, just imagine if you began to relate to your young daughter that we're not things. <laughs> there's no thing here, there's no thing there. There is a difference between one thing and another thing. But what's the difference between no thing and no thing? It starts to dissolve the trance of separation which we have lived in most of us, our whole lives. The answers that other people give to this kind of inquiry, and I've investigated this with thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people over the last decades, people will say things like, it's incredibly peaceful. There are no boundaries. There's no limits. When I check into this which I truly am, there's no beginning, no end to it. It has no birth in time. It wasn't born because it's not a thing. And therefore, it also, it couldn't die. Mostly, people have experience of this dimension of themselves in a taste, in a snapshot. But a taste is enough. The great Zen poet Bunan once said, I tasted this for 15 seconds, and I spend the rest of my life earning the taste. This ability to drop into limitless dimension of yourself, limitless consciousness, to have direct experiential recognition of the dimension of yourself which is free, which was never born, which could never die, which is not separate. In my experience of working with people in this way, it's the most potent fertilizer for genius. In fact, you could say conversely, if we don't have access to that, that dimension of ourselves, what do we have access to? We have access to thoughts and feelings, right? We have access to repeating thoughts and feelings which are almost without exception conditioned borrowed from our culture, from our parents, from religion, from teachers. The thought machine is really only capable of regurgitating what it's received into another form, which is why so much art, so much technology is imitative, imitating something that somebody else conceived. When you drop into the dimension of yourself which is free, it allows for impulses to arise which have never arisen before. There are so many stories, if you investigate, so, in so many fields, the, the leaders, the founding fathers of this country, they were all, the great majority of them anyway, were mystics. They were exploring the mysticism of masonry. 
you'll find in the writings of um, Benjamin Franklin many references to this, the importance of being able to drop out of the me into the dimension where there is boundaryless consciousness. If we had longer, we could, we could explore the great leaders in almost every field and find the same pattern. Having access to infinity is the way in which impulses arise. Now, we could talk on each of these memes, we could talk for hours, but let's move on to the next important meme, which has to do with blocks and conditioning. I think I read today on, on Google, <laughs> I found the statistics for how much sperm a human male produces in his lifetime. It's like 525 billion sperm, right? But how many of those sperm actually make it to become an embodied expression of what each sperm, sperm had the potential? It's like a few. Most of the sperm that comes out of a man never makes it to become anything embodied or expressed. In the same way, I would suggest to you, for all of humanity, for all seven billion human beings, impulses are arising all the time. When you first wake up in the morning and you're still in a more spacious state, impulses, little ideas are arising all the time. How many of those impulses actually become manifest as something that can radically contribute to and shift the destiny of humanity, or at least people around you. You see the thing? The majority of impulsive, creative impulses that arise in you, they meet immediately with not birth control, but creativity control. <laughs> and creativity control means hard set ideas along the lines of, I'm not good enough. I don't have enough time. Who am I? Nobody listens to me. Does this sound familiar? Nobody would try it anyway. It's, it's too crazy. I don't have enough money. We could continue the whole day cataloging the mechanism of the conditioned mind that suppresses pure creative impulse. We could map it very easily if we sat together in a, in a workshop, we could easily map this out and we'd find almost any conditioned thought that anybody came up with, the, most of the rest of the room would say, would, would agree that that's a, a conditioned thought for them too. The, the conditioned mind is entirely programmed. It operates along principles that are the same for almost everybody. So what's necessary in order to bring forth genius in a way that's reliable is to have technology to be able to address those blocks which interfere with the arising of creative impulse. So how are you going to do that? The difficulty is that you don't consciously choose those thoughts when they arise, right? A thought like, I'm not good enough, you don't have the idea, now I'm going to have an I'm not good enough thought. Just a minute. There it is. <laughs> you don't do that. It comes on its own. But when a thought like, I'm not good enough, or there's not enough money, or nobody listens to me, when it arises to block creativity, generally, what relationship instinctively do we form with that thought? Aversion. Who said it? Aversion. It's totally true, isn't it? Whenever these, these creativity blocking thoughts arise, and there are lots of them, the immediate response is aversion. So we've been experimenting. I, I teach a method called awakening coaching. We've been experimenting over decades to discover what can we do to unplug the power from that conditioned thinking so that creativity has more opportunity to express itself. And the key, actually, is what you just said. The key is aversion. When a thought arises and it's allowed to pass through, which is quite rare, it actually does has 
almost no effect on the way that you behave in your life. You start to discover these thoughts that are like a mouse with a megaphone, making a lot of noise but with very little inherent power. So the key is to have a technology, not that gets rid of the thoughts. That's actually, the, in my opinion, that's the rabbit hole that we often try to go down. We try to get rid of negative thoughts or make them into positive thoughts. But the more energy you give to a thought form, the more you turn up the volume on the megaphone. The key, as you suggested, is to have a technology not to get rid of the thought form, but to relax the resistance. So that's the meme, right? That's the meme is to recognize that any thought form, when resisted, becomes real. The more you push it against it, the more real it becomes. Any thought form, when unresisted, and unresisting is not just a matter of not resisting. Unresisting is a creative act. Any thought form, when unresisted, actually, instead of becoming bigger, it dissipates. It becomes humorous. It passes through, leaving you free to give the gift you were born to give. Again, each of these memes we could explore in much greater depth, but let's move on to the next meme, which has to do with practice. We don't really need practice to have awakening. Awakening is always in this moment simply the willingness to return attention to what is here. We do need practice to be able to live that creative source in day-to-day -day life. Not only do we have conditioned thoughts, conditioned beliefs, all of us we have conditioned ways of behaving which are held in place through homeostasis. What that means is you show up at work in a certain way. Maybe you show up and you're the guy who's always a little bit shy and, or you're somebody who's really... And everybody's used to you behaving like that. So if the shy guy shows up one day and goes like, yeah, everyone's going to be completely shocked. Not because it's a strange way to behave. It's an unexpected way for that person to behave. You see what I mean? So as soon as you enter into a relationship with other people or with an environment, you enter into an unspoken contract of homeostasis which means that in order to free up genius, we need tailor-made practice. One size fits all practice won't work because it just becomes another habit. We need tailor-made practice to antidote, to exaggerate, to make humorous the habits which have governed our lives. I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples. Again, each of these topics is a, is a huge thing to explore in more depth. I'll give you a very quick example of uh, a university professor I worked with a few years ago who wanted to write a book. Now, the habit he developed over years was of being a very serious, respectable university professor. He was, you know, nobody laughed at him. And it was to do with his childhood, his conditioning. He, it was important to him to be taken very seriously. But you can imagine when he tried to write a book, it became very quickly an academic, very sturgid book. So we had to find a tailor-made practice for him, not a practice that is going to be the same for everybody, just you know, everybody meditate for 20 minutes or everyone do this yoga posture. We had to find the perfect practice for him, like a homeopathic medicine that would free up his genius. And this is perhaps one of the most important gifts that a good coach or a good mentor can bring to you is to find tailor-made practice. So this was the practice we found for him. It's a random example. He had to give lectures at the university in the huge auditorium with 500, 800 seats. So I said to him, next time you're going to give one of these really big lectures where he was the serious professor, I said, before you go to give the, the lecture, go to a costume store and buy a cat's tail. They sell tails there. And attach it to the back of your pants. <laughs> So, of course, he came in, he started to give the lecture, everything was normal. He was the serious professor. He quickly forgot about the tale, of course. And then he had to turn around at some point to write something on the, uh, the whiteboard behind him, revealing the tale. Well, it was just a little murmur at the beginning. People were bringing out, quietly bringing out their cell phone, taking a picture. 
it only took that one lecture, one hour lecture of him wearing a tail to dismantle the homeostasis of him, him being the serious professor. After that, he could walk around the campus. Everybody would give him a wink or a wave because they knew that's the guy who wore the tail. And that's just a, a silly example. There are, there are an infinite number of examples of where the right practice for the right person can disrupt the homeostasis enough that it frees up not a new way of behaving. You see, that would be another conditioning. It frees up a return to innocence, a return to childlike play, which is the environment in which genius can happen. The sixth meme I want to briefly touch on today is the recognition of unique gift. The recognition as we drop more and more deeply into infinite consciousness, into consciousness without limits, as we free up blocks through removing resistance, as we find tailor-made practices that can disrupt the encrusted habits and allow you to live more freely, more spontaneously, what reveals itself after a while is the astounding recognition that just as each of us in this room has a unique fingerprint, just as each of us in this room has a unique face that is very rarely confused with anyone else's face, so each person in this room and each person that you know in your life has a unique gift to give to the world. But I hesitate to say unique gift because I don't mean necessarily that they, there was a, there's a particular product that they were born to invent or uh, anything as manifest as that. I mean that each person has a unique energetic flavor. A flavor which, if it's not fully given through you, it will never be given. Just like if you don't put your thumb on the, on the thumbprint thingy <laughs> and give your thumbprint, that thumbprint will never get recorded because nobody else has got the same thumbprint as you. If the gift, which is inherently your genius, is not delivered into the world in your lifetime, it simply is not given. It remains unmanifest, which sounds sad, but unfortunately, it's still more or less the default setting for humanity. Most gifts go ungiven. In small ways, they get given, but I know from coaching people, majority of people I work with, they know that what they really came to give is still held back. Does that make sense? We are rapidly, because of the way society is changing, because of the, the democratization of genius, with um, YouTube, which is owned by which company? I've forgotten. <laughs> because of technologies like YouTube, anybody can unlock their genius and share it with the world very, very easily. The unique gift means a reliable technology to be able to tap into the energetic flavor which is uniquely yours and to find the right match for it in the world so that the song that remains unsung is fully delivered. And the last meme, which I'll briefly touch on, is called spontaneous creation, which is actually the opposite of what we spoke about with unresisting. Spontaneous creation means as you get more and more proficient in a technology of consciousness that allows you to hover in a more expansive state, it's possible to deliberately, consciously create impulses which were not there before. Just like in quantum physics where subatomic particles are both particular and wave-like at the same time depending upon the observation. In the same way, it's possible to become more and more adept in hovering in more expansive states so that we can generate frequencies out of nothing. A great example would be happiness. Happiness is actually a frequency. Many times you can be happy for no reason just because you're in the happiness frequency. Well, we try in a very laborious way to create happiness by creating circumstances that should create happiness, which is quite inefficient actually. There is the possibility to be able to vibrate a happiness frequency 
in a quantum state. So that instead of you having to create happiness by rearranging your life, you can vibrate a happiness frequency or a compassion frequency or a creativity frequency, and your life rearranges itself like the iron filings in a magnetic field to demonstrate the frequency which you have dropped into an infinite state of all possibility. That was a very rushed guided tour to a technology of genius. Obviously, it raises more questions than answers. But let's take the last few minutes to see um, where you might like to uh, explore this further. Yes, hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I just, I'm not familiar with the coaching practice that yes. you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. The coaching practice is not actually, there's not that much more to say about it than what I've said. It's simply, it's, I talked earlier about memes and tools. So the Awakening Coaching provides very specific, reliable, tested tools which bring into practice the memes I've described here. So for example, so, sorry, can you talk a little bit about more specific, is it like an online practice, oh, is it an see. individual thing you're doing? Yeah, uh, coaching is, the, the coaching, the way we, we practice coaching is done in a contract of 10 or 10 weeks or so, 8, 10 or 10, 12 weeks, where the, the thing about coaching is everything that's important about a coaching relationship needs to emerge from within the coaching client. Otherwise, it becomes teaching, you see? If the, if the coach is going to tell you this is where your life should be going, it becomes a form of didactic cheat teaching. Coaching is really a relationship which brings forth what is wanting to burst forth from within you. So in a coaching relationship, at the beginning of the relationship, you would talk with your coach about the impulses you can feel are wanting to come alive. Maybe you want to write a book. Maybe you want to bring an invention into solidity. Maybe you want to fall in love and be married. Maybe there's all sorts of things you might want. And there's a, there's a distinction in my vocabulary between wanting something and having an intuitive longing for something. It's a little different. Wanting something is like a, it's more solid. I want that. A longing is more like a, it's, a, it's something that's already within you wanting to give birth and express itself. So love, I would say, is more of a longing. Right? A new car is more of a desire. Yeah? Whereas, but, but excitement and travel could be more of a longing. You see, So a coach would help you get clear about what are your natural longings. What is the evolutionary trajectory which is authentically yours, not imposed upon you? And that can take some unraveling, because we've been so conditioned being told what we should want in all sorts of ways, by religion, but also by the self-help, self-improvement industry, also by spirituality. All of those forces have contributed to ideas about what we should be wanting or where we should be pointing. A good coach will help you to unravel back to what is authentically your evolutionary traje traje trajectory. And then the coach will be able to help you express that in verifiable terms. That we can, so after 10 weeks, we can see if we got that or not, or if we got to the point where we're confident about that or not. Right? When I say confident about that, you might have the evolutionary impulse, I want to be married and have a family, and you're single. I'm not saying you're single, but somebody might be. Right? Well, we wouldn't want to set up an expectation in 10 weeks of coaching, you're going to be married with a family. I don't know how we could do that. right? But we could set up an outcome that at the end of 10 weeks of coaching, any block or doubt about the flow of love could be dissolved. So it's kind of obvious that you are a loving being and that love flows in your life easily. So then a coach would meet with you. It can be done on uh, Google Hangout. <laughs> or any other video technology. It can be done uh, on the phone. But you don't need physical contact. It's completely unnecessary, we've, we've discovered. We'll meet with you every two weeks for a longer session where you mostly will you'll drop into radical awakening, which I described, into the direct experience of infinite consciousness. And then we use these technologies to dissolve the blocks. It's a, a technique called radical releasing that takes only a few minutes. Um, 
and it's it's about 80% effective. I couldn't say 100%, but about 80% of the time we can take a thought form like nobody listens to me, we can dissolve it, and two weeks later when we test it, it still has no power anymore. And, it, and that is then true in perpetuity. About 20% are more sticky, and then we have to, to do that repeatedly. So a coach will, every two weeks, will meet with you, but what's more, most important thing, what actually makes this effective, is that in that two-week gap, the coach will give you a set of tailor-made practices. It's probably going to be a set of practices that nobody has ever had before in that combination. And the practices are to gently and humorously disturb your homeostasis, right? So that you actually start to show up in each situation as a different person. And it's quite miraculous to see this happen, that after two weeks, the coaching client comes back, and it's simply not the same person that was there two weeks before. So they, they qualify for a whole new set of practices, you see. So gradually, you realize that what you thought was you was just a bundle of habits. Who you really are is a pure potentiality. Who you really are is like, it's like the, the goodie box from which all goodies arise. And, and certain, certain goodies are put on display, which can be put back in the box, and different ones can be brought out. So over time, different practices will free everything up to allow your natural genius to flourish. So where can we find more resources in terms of finding things on your site or right. well, a, more? A really great, if what I've said today um, was interesting or resonated, a really great next step would be to check out the book that we have at the back of the room, Better Than Sex. Um, I would suggest to start there because everything is in the book. We have um, a website, awakeningcoachingtraining.com. I have my own website, arjunaarda.com, because I write other books too. And um, yeah, feel we've got a lot of people all over the world. If this resonates for you, if it sounds interesting, feel free to get in touch and we can explore more deeply. Thank you so much for inviting me to Google today. Thank you.